Good morning, church. Let's stand together. Welcome to New City Church. It's my uh, joy to welcome you here today. Um, if this is your first time, welcome. Thank you for coming. We have a welcome station in the back. On that back wall, you'll see a TV and a bunch of books. Um, we would love if you took a stop by there, um, either on the seven minute break or afterwards, there's a connect card. I didn't grab it on my way up, but you can fill it out with your name and address. It's just a way for us to connect with you and see how we can um, uh, answer any questions you might have. So you can go over there to that back station and fill one of those out. Um, and we would love to see you there as well. And what I would like to do next, I apologize, is read our call to worship. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 14310. And it says, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. 
Let's pray. Lord, we are here because of you. We are um, we're saved. We are redeemed. We are made perfect because of the faith given to us by the work of your son. So Lord, let this day be a day of, of repentance, of rejoicing. Lord, if, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, that, that you would show yourself to them, save them, show them your good mercy, your grace and forgiveness, Lord. So we want to worship you and honor you today because you are worthy and you deserve all of this and more. And so we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. John shared last week about the Trinity, about the, the Holy Spirit, and so just our, just our, our continual and constant need of the Spirit to point us toward Jesus, to exalt Christ, and uh, so we're going to sing him. We're going to sing this. I want us to sing this from the heart. We we need. The Lord's strength. We need his leading, his conviction. His, we need him to set our eyes upon Christ. Amen. All right. Oh Lord, fill us with your spirit. Guide us by your presence. How we need you, God. to your kingdom bring us back to freedom how we need you God how we need you God oh Lord fill us with your spirit See you. 
praise you this morning. We thank you for, for salvation, Lord. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for coming to die to pay for our sin and everything else, Lord. All good things that come to us from you, Lord, your provision, your encouragement, Lord, your rebukes, whatever, Lord, it is that uh, when you speak to us as our Father, we, we praise you for it. We thank you for this morning, Lord. Help us to lift our voices to you. Help us to see you as magnificent, as awesome, as caring, as patient. We praise you, Lord. charge you guys can have a seat so we have some announcements and we're going to go into our prayer time after the announcements um, so a couple announcements our sixth annual you are loved Christmas event is December 16th from 6 to 8 we will have a gift for everyone local made Christmas treats singing a Christmas performance and a message we also have free um, family photos, um, so be there, plan to be there on December 16th from 6 to 8. 
um, invite your family, friends. Um, we also have the second annual Feed My Sheep conference, and that is Saturday, December 10th. Um, it's a day conference for pastors and church leaders. Um, if you are not a pastor or a church leader, you still could come. Um, there's going to be um, people speaking. Um, we will have um, food. Um, if you want to go, we ask that you register on the website um, so we could just have a count on how many people will be there. Um, we also, um, there is no youth group today. And um, the other announcement is um, just a reminder that um, we still need um, one or two host families for um, safe families. And if you are interested in that, um, you could talk to Callie. Um, she has more information on that. Um, so we will now go, go into our prayer time. Um, we do a topic every week for praying. Um, this week we're going to be praying on hope. Um, we also will take a seven-minute break after our prayer time. You can fill up on coffee. Um, the kids will go to the children's ministry. Um, if you want, um, not if you don't, well, let's see here. Um, so, yeah, so we'll take a seven-minute break. Um, we will also take this time to um, give to the church. Um, we use that as an act of worship. Um, we'll have instructions on the screen if you want to give um, through your phone, or we have a box in the back. Um, so we'll now go into prayer time. So if you want to just pray with me. Lord, thank you for this um, time, Lord. Thank you for um, our church. Um, Lord, we pray for the leaders of our church and... Um, Lord, thank you for um, a time where we can just pray and celebrate you, Lord. And um, thank you, Lord, for um, dying on the cross so that we can be set free. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Um, Lord, we just want to pray for, um, for hope, Lord. Um, we want to have um, hope um, in you, Lord, and um, we want our hope to be strong, Lord. Um, and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Um, and Lord, thank you for being our rock. And Lord, be with us um, as we um, go into um, the message, Lord. And we pray for the kids. We pray that they will um, have listening ears. And we pray for the teachers who are teaching the kids. And Lord, um, be with us through the rest of this um, day and through the um, upcoming week. Thank you, Lord, for this church family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So now we'll take a seven-minute break.
All right, New City Church, let's go ahead and find our seats and we'll get started. All right. We'll have plenty of time to fellowship after the service. I love that you guys want to talk. We'll have plenty, plenty of time. But let's go ahead and find our seats. We'll get into the Word together. If you've noticed, it actually looks a little bit more Christmassy here. So uh, thanks for the, uh, the people that came in in the middle of the week and dug out all of our Christmas stuff. And there's a few things. And so through this season, it'll get progressively more decorated leading up to our You Are Loved event, which we have an awesome team of people that are uh, really behind making this event look um, amazing and be and really, really, really good for our community this year. So make sure that you are praying about that on December 10th, um, excuse me, December 16th. Be at the You Are Loved event and bring as many people as you can. Let's fill every single chair and then some. We'll go into the other rooms, into the attics. We'll get all the chairs. We'll fill all the spaces. If there's, if there's need, we'll do that. So let's pray to that end because the gospel is going to be delivered like, as it is here every week. But Christmas is a time where people are thinking about things in, in, a, you know, in, in light of the season, right? It's, there's something about it still. So let's not give up hope on that. But it is the first week of Advent. Um, how, many, how many of you guys celebrate in an intentional way Advent each year in your family? Raise your hands higher. <laughs> I'm ashamed of it, you know. <laughs> That's awesome. So I would encourage those of you who don't, maybe you think it sounds too traditional or too religious, it sounds too Catholic or something, I don't know. It's not. Uh, it's an intentional season leading up to Christmas, and uh, we're going to talk about that today, what Advent is, and maybe that'll change your mind so that every year you do this as, a, as an intentional way for your family to worship through the Christmas season up till Christmas Day. And uh, there's, a, there's a real good scriptural, a biblical reason for that as well. But today is part one of our Advent series. And so if you guys would just pray with me, and then we will get into the message together. Father, I'm thankful for my church family. Thank you for your precious blood-bought people. Thank you for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming to this world so many years ago, and uh, that he himself was a fulfilled promise. And you are still the God of the very same promises, and, and there are reasons to hope today, reasons for us to not be filled with fret and fear in our world. And I pray that these things would become very clear to us today. I'm thankful for your word. Thank you that your word is true and that your word is good. So I pray that today as uh, the word is delivered that you'd give us all ears to hear. And I pray you'd remove all unnecessary distractions from the room. Lord, that if there's people in this room today that, that need to hear the gospel, maybe for the first time, God, you'd give them ears to hear, and that every person around them would have the mindset of pointing them to Jesus, and that all the distractions would be gone. Lord, your will be done today. Be glorified in our time together. Make your truth clear to us now, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So the season of Advent is really the discipline of putting ourselves in the shoes of Old Testament Israel. That's hard to do. That takes some, some, some effort, some real effort on our part, because that's not our culture. And we uh, tend to be a very um, closed-minded, put-the-blinders-on sort of society. We don't think about other cultures very often. We're, Americans tend to be very American-minded. It's about us. It's about our freedom, our rights, our things. So you have to, as a Christian, we have a, a great opportunity, though, by God's Word, with God's Word, to, to not be that way and to look at other people and look at cultures through God's lens. And so Israel certainly has a great part to play in all of Scripture. Most of the Bible covers the story of God's dealings with Israel. So the discipline that Advent gives us is to put ourselves in the shoes of Old Testament Israel and try to feel what it would feel like to long for the most anticipated event, event in the history of the world, which was the arrival of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We have a different perspective, don't we? We are 2,000 years, some odd years, post the, the coming of Christ and the ministry of Christ. It's, 
Sadly, it's like old news to us. Well, yeah, that's already happened. But picture now what it would be like to be before Christ and thousands of years of history of waiting and feeling the longing of the most important event in all of human history. That's what Advent is for. So I want to just remind you that the word Advent simply means arrival. That's all it means. It means arrival. The birth of Jesus Christ was the first Advent, the first arrival of the Messiah, of God coming to earth. A couple of things to remember to help this season be more productive. Advent is a season of waiting. In a similar way, our culture around this time of year begins this anticipated, uh, impatient children, um, all this stuff that comes with, with waiting for Christmas Day, right? Waiting for gifts. Waiting. So you can kind of see the world has sort of morphed this idea of waiting, and so we wait for consumer things and to get, 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 right? But there's, a, there's another thing that we can do with that intentionally. Think about the hard waiting and, the, and what actually happens to the soul when you wait with patience that God gives. Advent is a season of expectation. That's good. We have that parallel with the culture that is very good, this expectation of great things, what's coming, family get-togethers and great meals and gifts and things that you're going to do, good traditions that don't detract from the true message, but good things, expectations. And so we put ourselves in the shoes of Old Testament Israel of what it would be like to anticipate and to expect and to wait with longing. Advent is a season of hoping in God's promises. And traditionally, the first Sunday of Advent is all about hope. And so we're going to really focus in on that and more specifically the messianic hope of Israel. The title of the message this morning is Confident Hope in Christ. And so what we're going to do all through this season is each message is going to have a sort of a comparison. We're going to look, we're going to dive into some aspect of the Old Testament life of Israel Today we're going to look at their hope and how they hoped in what was coming, and then we're going to make a parallel with the fulfillment in Jesus Christ and and our hope and how we can hope with a greater expectation. And so we have hope, peace, love, and joy. Those things are going to be covered. And uh, so you can just be praying for all of those messages and that that God would bring um, the right people here to hear the message and that we as God's people would be faithful through the season of Advent to be intentional be intentional about being here, being, uh, anticipating what God wants to say. So if you turn to Genesis chapter 3, it really begins there. You've probably all read Genesis chapter 3 at some point in your life. Even people who don't read the Bible very much, every time they try, they start in Genesis, so they usually get to chapter 3 before they give up. So maybe you've already read it and you don't have much interest in the Bible at all. But Genesis 3 is really the beginning of the hope of Israel, the hope of a Messiah, In Genesis 3, we have what is called the Proto-Evangelium, just a very fancy word that says, that's basically saying it's the first gospel message that was preached in Scripture. There in Genesis chapter 3, before Christ was ever here, this is the first hint of the coming Messiah. So Genesis chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 13. It says, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, of course, there's a whole context here most of you would be familiar with, but all of this had already gone down. The serpent had deceived Eve, and now he's, the Lord is giving judgment of that. Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity Between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband and he shall rule over you. But look back at verse 15. This is really, this is the proto-evangelium. This is that gospel message. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So remembering the context, Adam and Eve had displayed or disobeyed and were separated from God as a just consequence. That had already happened. They disobeyed the command of God and they've now been separated from God and they will be pushed outside of the garden. That's the context. But notice the detail of this verse 15. It says, God would put enmity in the midst of the serpent and the woman. That's God's doing. God is 
putting enmity, a hate, you know what enmity means? Hatred. God put hatred between the serpent and the woman. A war, a, a hatred between, more specifically, the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. The descendants, those that would come from the, offspring, the, the serpent and the woman. But the word for offspring is the word seed. Some of your translations say offspring, some say seed. The more specific, accurate translation is seed in the Hebrew. A word that unmistakably refers to the, to the contribution in procreation that a woman just does not have. So as you're studying this passage and as Israel is looking at this text, there's a mystery already. There is no seed of the woman. This is not accurate. So what is God saying? God is doing something here. This is a mystery. So the curse upon the serpent is miraculous in nature. That's important to, to understand. What is being said here is that at some point in the future of humanity, based on this text, a virgin woman would give birth to a child. Now, why, how could we jump already to a, a virgin birth by this text? Well, all of Scripture echoes what begins here in Genesis 3 and confirms to us this mystery is going to come to pass and God is completely in control of how to remedy this curse that has now come upon the world. And he's saying this to the serpent. There will be enmity between you and the woman. So just a couple of scriptures that are very common around Christmas time. Just throw these on the, on the board. You guys can read these and take note of them uh, in light of what we're talking about. Isaiah, Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the prophet Isaiah uh, taking what is true of what God has already said through the ages and saying this is what's coming. This is what's coming. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That's impossible, by, by the way. This is only possible with God. This is a miraculous thing. And his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. The, what's being proclaimed is that God is coming. God is coming to earth. And then Isaiah 9, 6 says, for, us, for to us a child is born, so specifically a child, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So that's an incredible detail that we have there in Genesis chapter 3. Who is it that's going to do this? We already referred to it. Who is it that's going to do this very thing? The very one who put the enmity there is the one who's going to do this thing. The quote was, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's God. So something I want you to kind of remember through this whole uh, sermon and through the series is that God is the one who's going to do it. God will do it. It is God's doing, all of this. God stepped into the midst of this and announced his plan in Genesis 3 that one day, though it would be a long wait and a hard wait. Haven't you ever asked that question, why didn't God take care of it then? Right? We probably, a thinking Christian who has read Scripture and about the plan and the years and the history, you've probably thought that at some point in your young Christian life at least, why didn't God do it at that point? Why not fix it there in Genesis 3? And of course, there's a sovereign purpose that God sees all things and He knows the reason why He does certain things. But this would be a long wait, a hard wait, but God one day would crush the serpent. That's the important part. Not why didn't God do it then, but that God stepped in and announced the gospel and said that there's going to be a crushing of the head of Satan. At the very thought of evil, the very mastermind behind the permeation of evil in this world. All decept- that, that head, that person, there will be a crushing That's an incredible promise, that God would do it. It would be a lot of waiting, but God would do it, not when one might expect, but in a meticulously planned blow at the exact right time. All through the New Testament, we see that God's coming to earth and his death, burial, and resurrection was according to God's timing. He had it planned. It wasn't a moment too soon. It wasn't a moment too late, and God did this. 
In the text it says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is a pronouncement of the battle, what it would look like. What is this, how is this going to carry out? So spoken to the serpent, God says, your time is limited and my rule is final. See, God pronounced the end of this curse, ultimately how the curse would grip the human heart. And God pronounces an end to it. A descendant of Adam's would be born and would crush the serpent, but in the process would himself suffer. That's what's being said here. While there is a crushing, the head will be crushed, the heel of the crusher would be bruised. It would cost something. There would be pain. There would be suffering for it. Had Jesus Christ not risen from the dead, this whole prophecy would be meaningless. Had there been a Messiah that would come and then he would die and then all of his claims were put to nothing because he did not rise and he did not prove to to be who he said he was, all of this would be nothing. But Christ came, he suffered for sinners, he took the wrath of God against sin and sinners upon himself and he died. Then, three days later, he raised from the grave, making his death look like nothing more than a mere bruise on the heel. He rose, conquered sin and death. That is the very fulfillment of the Genesis 3 proto-evangelium, the crushing of the head of Satan and the bruising of the heel of the Messiah. That's good news for us. That's the history of the gospel. It goes farther back than that. You want to go even get more excited about God and the gospel is that this was in God's mind for eternity. This has always been the plan. The Son of God slain before the foundation of the world. All of this is in their future. So think about this being Israel now. Think about this being every generation from Adam. This is in their future. We can see it. We can read Scripture and and look back. They could not, but it was a promise for them. Very, very early on in the history of man, a promise to cling on to, to hope in. And a promise from God is as good as finished promise from God is as good as finished. And so began the history of God's redemption in which God's people would wait with expectation and not without hope. So I want to just give a little bit of a a kind of a rounded recap. So just pay attention. We'll get to some other scriptures here in a moment. But they were not without hope. Hope that a Christ, an anointed one, the Messiah, would come. He would come. Hope that God would do it. Looking back constantly to this pronouncement in Genesis chapter 3. Time would show that the curse was indeed active in the world, though. An all-out war was waging between light and darkness. That was for sure. Good and evil was present present between Satan and all who believed the promise of God. There was an all-out war, and there still is. It's a little different today. There's a victory today, and I will get to that. It's so exciting. I just want to say it now. It's like done. It's finished, right? Oh, man, I just gave it away. But So put yourself in their shoes for a moment. Right after that promise, what happens? Cain killed Abel. What would you do? I thought there was hope. I thought that this was going to be okay. God just made a pronouncement. That Satan was going to be crushed. And then there's murder. I don't know about you. Like We've been desensitized. We hate murder. We should. should hate it at all levels. What about the first one? The very first one. God had just made life. And a brother kills a brother. You would know the curse is upon this world. The taking of a human life. Cain killed Abel, which was an attempt to snuff out the seed. You have to know, all of that has happened through history is Satan's attempt, all through it, woven through it, is Satan's attempt to snuff out the seed, the promise of Messiah. Why kill Abel? Abel had the good sacrifice. He was the one that was pleasing to the Lord. Cain hated it. He was jealous. He killed him. Then Seth was born, and a lineage of faithfulness to the promise of God began to emerge in contrast to the lineage of Cain. So read the Bibles in light of this. Read your Bibles in light of this, and you'll see a, a big plan, a beautiful plan emerging. Cain built cities and sought for achievement, while Seth's line sought the Lord. And we see men like Enoch, who walked with God, and we see men like Lamech and Noah, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And all of this is happening while Cain's descendants are building cities and seeking after fame and fortune and achievement. 
and trying to become God. And we still see that in the world today, don't we? After the flood, we follow Noah's sons, and only one son is blessed with redemptive lineage. One of his sons, out of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, God chooses Shem to carry the line under his descendants. We eventually come to Abraham. Through Shem comes Abraham, another familiar name. And these are the names that God highlights, not because they're perfect people, but because God chose them by his grace and by his mercy. So Abraham comes on the scene, a man chosen out of the world by grace to be the father of the Jewish people, ultimately a father of many nations. And you know the basics of this. From Abraham, we see Isaac and then Jacob. God choosing for himself a line through which the seed would be born in Israel's future. All of this connecting back to Genesis 3, this mindset of there's coming a seed, an offspring. Lineage was important to Israel, was it not? Genealogies were, why so important? Why think so much about family and lines? Because the Messiah was going to come through a particular line. And it was all about that. Jacob has 12 sons, and one of his sons' names is Judah. Judah was chosen out of all of the brothers, and he receives this incredible promise in Genesis 49.10. This is said of specifically Judah. Look at this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, the scepter, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people's. Again, this is a connection to what is already in the mind of Israel, that there is a ruler coming, there is a king coming, there is a conqueror that is coming. This promise infusing hope constantly into Israel's mind as life and circumstances just keep going up and down. So this is a prediction of a lineage of kings, a lineage of kings. And the scepter from Judah's line will never depart from Judah. It's an incredible promise. Now, kings were not always in the picture for Israel. A lot of you guys know this. God would rule his people through his law. Then, judges would uphold the law and a priesthood to offer sacrifices and mediate between God and man. But no king would rule over Israel until who became the first king, church, over Israel? Saul. Saul becomes the first king. You know your your biblical theology then. And Saul was a big letdown. He had all of the worldly accolades, strength and power and looks. He was head and shoulders above all the other men. He is who you would choose to lead your armies if you were going by man's standards. But in the end, he what? He disobeyed God. He was not God's man. He did not follow after God. He chose his own way. God allowed Israel to go from a theocracy ruled by God to a monarchy like the rest of the nations. They begged God. God, let us have a king like the rest of the nations. Now, God in his sovereignty, knowing the plan that he himself had from all eternity, allowed this to happen. Surely, in a human understanding, Israel would have been better off remaining under the rule of God alone. We could look at that and say, man, they should never have had the king. They shouldn't, but they did. God allowed it. You see his sovereign plan, his hand over all of it. But at the end of the day, this was all moving toward the Messiah, and it had to be done. Look at 1 Samuel 13, just a uh, short text from there. So we're doing, like I said, we're kind of surveying Old Testament history. 1 Samuel 13, we see Saul is king and he's fighting the enemies of Israel and he chooses to disobey God by not seeking the Lord's favor. He's only a king for a few years when the prophet says this in 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14. He says, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God which, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now you or your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now, New City, who is it that the Lord has sought out? Who is he talking about right now? He's talking about David. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1. If you just flip over there. 
We're obviously skipping a lot of filler and a lot of stuff that should be known. Definitely let this just motivate you to read more. But this is what happens. Uh, after he makes this pronouncement to Saul, verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, Samuel was the prophet, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And so he sends the prophet to Jesse, a farmer with sons, one of which is going to be the king over Israel. And the boy doesn't even know it. If you read the story, he's out in the, he's out in the field with the sheep. All the brothers get lined up and, he, he, oh, you're surely that's the one. He's rugged. He's ruddy. He's like, he, no. Oh, do you have any more kids? Yeah, the, the little guy in the field. Go get him. He's going to be king. God does it way different than we, than we do, Right? And David is the greatest king Israel ever had. David becomes this amazing king. It is incredible, the stories of David. He was not a perfect man, right? We know he failed. He failed miserably at times. So this is comforting to us. We understand that God does not call perfect people, but he calls people to serve him and to have faith in him. And through faith in him, we receive his righteousness. And it's the same way with the Old Testament and New Testament. David knew there was a Messiah coming, and he had faith in that. Now we have what is called the Davidic dynasty. David was a mighty warrior and an incredible king. But what is most incredible is the promise from God that has already been established in his line. Do you remember what was said of Judah earlier? From Your hands, the scepter, will not depart. Well, you have to know that David comes through the line of Judah. So God is fulfilling his promise. David was a descendant of Judah, the son of Jacob, who was told, your, the scepter will not be taken from your line. And now here comes David, and he's from that line. Israel's history, though, is, is full of wickedness. We know this, including many wicked kings. So if you read through the kings, you see this. You see wicked kings, uh, oftentimes, every other chapter, a few chapters in a row, you're like wicked kings over Israel. When you read through the first and second kings, it can even get discouraging how many times you see the phrase, quote, and the king did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. These are kings over God's people. But God always brought them back and raised up a good king as soon as the people repented of their idolatry and turned back to God. And so you see this back and forth happening all through the history of Israel's kings. And then in 2 Samuel 7, God makes a covenant with David. Covenants are something we see all through the Old Testament. It's a promise from God, and there's different types of covenants. And so we're going to recognize a few of those. But in 2 Samuel, God makes a covenant with David. David wanted to build a house for God. Essentially, what you see is David looking around. He's like, well, my house is built out of cedar. Like, this is really nice. God lives in a tent, right? There was still just the temporary tabernacle. And so David's like, I want to build you a house, God. Like, it's quite, a, quite an endeavor to build a house for God, right? So he wants him to have something better than the tabernacle, but God does not allow David to build it. But rather, he promises that his son will build it, and he will establish his throne as well. So 2 Samuel, beginning in chapter 16 of verse 7, just one verse, just to see, again, kind of carrying through some history. This is said of the son, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Who's that being said of? Solomon. This is not David. This is Solomon David, through reasons that God had, because there was too much blood on his hands, God chose that Solomon would be the one instead. And so there it is again, a forever throne, carrying all the way through the Old Testament, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. A forever dynasty that will never end. Now think about all of this again in light light of what has transpired since Genesis chapter 3. Sin is in the world Life becomes hard. Cain kills Abel. Seth serves the Lord. Through his line comes Noah, and God rescues him from destruction and makes a covenant with him to never destroy the earth with a flood again. And God always preserves for himself a remnant. So that was a covenant with Noah. The line continues through Shem. Remember, we talked about Shem. Down to Abraham, and then God makes a promise to him, to Abraham, 
to make him the father of many nations and to bless the whole world through what? Through his offspring. Again, the word offspring comes up all through the history of Israel. Through your offspring, the world would be blessed. God makes an unconditional covenant with Abraham that his descendants will have a land of their own. They will have descendants that outnumber the stars and a promise of blessing and redemption. God is going to do this. Now, you know the story. All odds are against Abraham and Sarah. They're too old for children. It is impossible, but God makes it possible. God fulfills his promise, and they carry on that lineage. So for the sake of time, let's just say that Israel was a failure to keep their side of the covenant. Israel failed at keeping their side of the covenant. They did not continually obey. They did not keep the commandments of God like he had commanded them. They absolutely failed. Thankfully, the covenant that God made with Abraham was unconditional. If you look back at the story, when God makes the covenant with Abraham, it's it's an interesting scene. Animals are cut in two and laid in a path, sacrificed. And the way in that time where two people would make a covenant, maybe over some land, the two of them would walk together through the sacrifices and promise and make a covenant with each other, whatever that agreement was. In the story, guess what happens to Abraham? He's asleep, and God walks through all by himself. What was he saying? I'm going to keep this covenant, even when you fail. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this happen. It's not going to be riding on humans, the human will. It's not going to be riding on our obedience. God does call for and ask for our obedience, but it does not ride on us. The the history of the world and the, the future of our destiny is not riding on human will. It's riding on God and his faithfulness to his own promises. Then David is this great king, a man after God's own heart. But in only 500 years' time, Israel is split into two kingdoms. Kings rise and fall, some good, many are wicked. Then Israel and Judah are besieged Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed and Israel is in captivity. That's about 500 years of history from David becoming king and then the captivity and the captivity of God's people. So this is all happening. We have this great king and then a history of wicked kings, good kings. The kingdoms are split. It's chaos. And then because of disobedience, Israel is taken into captivity. And because we've studied Daniel, this is not unfamiliar to you guys. This part of Israel's history is real. This actually happened. Now, here's the incredible thing about hope, real hope, hope that comes from God. You cannot kill hope that comes from God. You can't can't do it. You can't destroy it. You always have something to cling to that is sure. So I want you to think about all the things that you've ever hoped hoped in that have slipped through your fingers, that turned up to be failures, turned up to be untrustworthy. You couldn't hope in it. You hoped for it. You hoped in it, and it didn't come to pass. It lets you down. That never happens with God ultimately. Never. All of Israel's history is built on a promise, and that promise carried them through every single dark hour, including the captivity of an entire nation and the besiegement from Babylon, the most wicked nation in the world. So what would we do? Now, what would we do in this moment if our entire nation was just suddenly held captive by a wicked nation? <laughs> That's a really kind of a bad comparison. We're nothing like Israel, just so you know. And America is not God's chosen people, um, just in case you thought that. Just, sorry, I had to throw that out there. Wow, there's a lot of murmuring going on. <laughs> but every, through every single dark hour, they had a promise to cling to. Those prophecies from Isaiah we read earlier were about 300 years before the captivity happened. The promise of a son and a child and a virgin birth. That was 300 years before Israel's captivity by Babylon, approximately. Wicked kings would, would be warned of the destruction that was coming, and they would ignore it. They would ignore God's warnings. And a remnant clung to hope. A remnant would cling to the hope of what? The hope of a head-crushing offspring. That there was still somebody that was coming that would come through the line of David. This is David's line that we're talking about. Scripture continually pointed the Jews back to this hope. So look at Isaiah chapter 11 with me. Isaiah 11, 1. Isaiah 
Isaiah 11, 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of of the Lord. Again, this is coming before the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem. This is Isaiah the prophet speaking to Israel about this shoot, this stump. Now, the idea of a shoot rising out of a stump is the imagery of hope in the midst of destruction. Why is there a stump? The tree was cut down. It's about hope in the midst of destruction. There's a stump because the tree that was there was cut down in judgment, that being the apparent destruction of the Davidic dynasty when captivity would come. And by the time Christ was born, how was he born? He was born from the smallest of cities, raised in the poorest of towns, to the humblest of parents, In the meekest of circumstances, this shoot from the stump was promised. That is the seed of Genesis 3. That's the continued hope that Israel was to hold on to through their destruction. That uh, even though the tree was going to be cut down and God is going to judge Israel, which we know that the captivity was because of God's judgment, they disobeyed. There would come this little shoot out of the stump. And that shoot, just picture it, tiny little, it's it's the Satan crusher. (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's, it's the one, it's the seed, it's God's promise. And it doesn't come like we would want. We're like, well, we're looking for a warrior. We're looking for a great king. No, you, you, we need a humble savior. Somebody who's going to die and lay his life down. That's hope. Jeremiah prophesied right around the Babylonian captivity. So this is another prophet. He spoke uh, often just before the captivity and also up into it. But look at Jeremiah 23. If you turn over there with me, I know we're turning a lot, but this is good. Jeremiah 23, beginning in verse 5. I'll give you a second to turn there. Are you got, is this, hopefully I'm, I'm going, making things clear. I, really, I know there's a lot of history, and I hope this is really blessing you and causing you to just glorify Christ. Um, because that's the whole point of it. So Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6 says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Now this is what the prophets were saying. The the prophets were saying, don't give up. Don't stop looking to my promises. Keep trusting in God. The kingdom of God cannot be destroyed. That's what's being said. All the prophets, as they're speaking in times of destruction and captivity and all of the darkness, this can't be destroyed. God's kingdom cannot be destroyed. And then an even more familiar passage, because we've gone through Daniel. I want you to think about this for a moment. In Daniel... Chapter 2, verse 44, I'll just read it, it's on the screen. It says, And in those days, or the days of those kings, the king of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Again, a kingdom that is forever. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Again, you have kingdoms falling around it, and the, king, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, remaining forever lasting forever. Now, church, Israel had much to cling to. They had so much to cling to in their times of blessing and in their times of judgment. The advantage that we have is looking back, we can see that God kept his promise to David. We have just been shown once again that God, over thousands of years of history, kept his promise specifically That through the seed of the woman, through an offspring, through a lineage, God would bring salvation and redemption to a sinful world. And God kept his promise. We have seen that. We have it in his word. We are looking back and we see that God keeps his promise. He kept his promise to David. And we can see because Jesus, who is the son of David, the scripture tells us, 
and the shoot from the stump of Jesse, he did come forth. He came. We have Jesus Christ in history. You have to deal with it. If you've never dealt with Jesus, think about, think about his life. Who is he? What did he do? He's the most important, important character, important person in history that you could think about, contemplate, figure out why did he come? What was his purpose? You look at Jesus. You look to Christ. He's going to order the rest of your life. Your life in shambles, in chaos, hardship, darkness, you have no purpose, look to Christ, look to Jesus. He did come forth, and as Genesis 3 told us, he would suffer in the process of crushing Satan's, in crushing Satan, so that he could no longer deceive the world in wholesale fashion any longer. Things changed after Christ came and established his church. Now we have the body of Christ the whole body of Christ, you and me and all who trust in Jesus, spread all over the world, declaring the message of that kingdom. And that kingdom still stands, and it will never be destroyed. Jesus Christ is building his church, and the church will prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You can still see this endless, everlasting kingdom that has been established, and we are members of that kingdom if Christ, if Christ is our king. The Spirit of the Lord did rest upon Christ, as the prophet said, and he preached the everlasting kingdom of God, and that through faith we join that kingdom and live forever. The forever kingdom that has been prophesied since the beginning of time is a kingdom that you and I can join through faith. Through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of David, we become a part of that kingdom. Good news. Glory to God. This is, this is the good news. For them, hope remained because of the promise that they clung to and looked forward to. For you and me, what is our hope? So I really want to just talk about that now for the last bit of our time together. What is our hope? We know we have an advantage. We have God's word. We have the record of his faithfulness. We have the promises fulfilled, every bit of it. We can look and see the faithfulness of God to keep his promise and that those promises give hope. So what is our hope? It is still in a promise, it is still in a covenant, but it is a new covenant of grace sealed in Christ's blood. It's a new covenant. Today we choose to put our faith in the Son of God who descended from the lineage of David to crush the ultimate Goliath. You know, it's interesting, when you start reading these stories in light of what we know about the king and the kingdom, and that it's all about Christ, hopefully you start reading these stories a little bit differently. I know it's popular, popular to look at the, the accomplishments of the kings and the prophets and look at something like David and Goliath and go, well, man, I wish I could kill, kill a Goliath. And what about the giants in my life? Just I, I, I've said this before, but I want to remind you, the, the slaying of Goliath is not about you and I being like David and crushing our giants. Remember, who's the son of David? Jesus Christ. We're not the son of David. Jesus is the Messiah. David pointed to Christ, who would crush who? Satan. Who's Goliath to us? Sin, Satan, and the world. Crushed, slain under the feet of Jesus Christ. So we choose to put our faith in that Son of God, who descended from the lineage of David to crush the ultimate Goliath, which is sin, Satan, and death. He entered into heaven as our forerunner. After his death, burial, and resurrection, he goes to heaven. He becomes our forerunner. He becomes our high priest. Having finished the work of salvation on our behalf, he sits now, sits enthroned as king. The work is finished. He sits. The scripture says he sits at the throne, at the right hand of the Father. Knowing this, I just want you to ask yourself, what circumstance is there that could convince you now that it is not worth waiting any longer? All of us are waiting for something. We're waiting for some sort of, I hate to even use the word because it's been popularized by all kinds of bad teachers. We're waiting for some sort of breakthrough, right? I'm sorry, I, had, it's just, I don't like that word. But you, you know, you, you get the idea, something to happen, something beyond your ability to do it. You need to, you need something new. You need to overcome, right? You need 
healing, strength. We need Christ to, to return. That's what we're ultimately hoping. We're, Christ, would you return and make all of this perfect? Destroy, finally and forever, death at the resurrection. Do it now. We want him. We're waiting. We're waiting. But on a minuscule or a smaller scale, we're waiting for other things to happen in our homes and with the salvation of our, of our friends and our family. We have all sorts of things that we're waiting for. But is there anything, any circumstance that could convince you that it's not worth waiting any longer? How long have you waited? Have you waited 4,000 years? Have you waited constantly hoping in a promise that was made? See, God has given us all of those promises, and we see the fulfillment in Christ. And now Christ has come, he's died, he's risen again, and he's seated at the throne of the Father, and we give up so fast. But we have a sure hope. There is nothing this world can do to sway me that hope is lost or that the church is defeated. And I hope that that is the same for you. I'm convinced of it and you can be convinced of that. God's word convinces us. There is absolutely nothing, nothing that this world can do to sway me that hope is lost. You guys hear that? Because you will be tempted from time to time to think there is no more hope. Something's going to happen. Something's going to happen in the news. An event's going to take place. And we're going to go, what's the point? Can we still hope? But we're not looking at any of that. We're not looking at any circumstances. We're looking at Christ and his fulfilled promises and what's coming in the future. So there's nothing this world can do to convince us of that. No, brothers and sisters, be confident in Christ. Be confident in Christ. Look to him today. That is a constant reminder that we all need. If you are not looking to Christ, you need to look to Jesus. Look to him. You don't know what to say? Just say that. I don't know what to say, Lord. I don't know, what, I don't know exactly what I need, but I know that I'm trusting in other things. I look to Christ today. You can know when other things, you can know when you're looking to things other than Christ it starts to look like, like an, an endless cycle of failure when you're clinging to other things. Jesus doesn't fail. And look to him and keep hoping like our Old Testament brothers and sisters did for thousands of years. Turn to Hebrews 10, verse 19. We're going to close with this final word from God's word. Hebrews 10. As I read this, just cling to it. Put your hope there. Listen to it in light of all that we know about God and his promises and what he's done. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You can even see how this text in the New Testament is doing a similar thing that Old Testament texts do with our hope. It's a hope in what is coming. There is another advent. Part of this series is not to just to get us to look back and connect it to Christ, but understand there is a second advent. He's coming again. That is our hope. That he's coming and what he will do and accomplish at his coming. The final judgment, the resurrection, the eternal state of glory for his people. All of this that's going to happen. But look at what Christ has accomplished and notice that he tells us that there is action now. 
In light of what he has done, we have assurance of faith and a confident hope in him who made the promise. Our hope is in the person who promised it. But the call to action, holding fast to the confession, let us consider how to what? Stir up one another. So we are called to do something in light of what we now know, to stir each other up. And he, this author, puts it in the context of the church. See how important we are to each other? The day is approaching. The time is coming. We have this, ins- this sure hope, this confidence. So let us stir each other up to love and to good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. We need each other, church. We need each other. We need to be with each other. We need to cling to one another and encourage each other to look to Jesus daily. Encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So there's a lot to consider. My challenge to you would be, again, that our response should be faith in Christ. Our our response for believer and unbeliever today, whether you come into this room having already believed in Christ as your Savior, or you come into this room having no idea who Jesus is or what your next step is supposed to be, you're very confused. I'm giving you the answer. This is an open book test. The answer is look to Christ. Faith in Jesus, the Son of God, who died for your sins and rose from the dead to give you eternal life and forgiveness and a brand new life, new creation. Start all over as you look to Christ. And the answer, it's only in Jesus. It won't happen anywhere else. So let's pray. Let's pray together and let's ask the Lord to hide these truths deep in our hearts. And so, Father, thank you so much for the word that has been spoke today, Lord. Your word is so good. Thank you for the, the confident hope we can have. Thank you for Jesus Christ, the son of David, the one who holds the scepter and the one from whom no one will ever take that scepter, king forever, high priest forever, our mediator. Thank you for bringing us to the Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And I pray for people today in this room that are they're struggling with hope. Their hope has been dashed. Their hope is, is rocky. Uh, it's, it's, it's shaky. I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would draw people to the, the solid rock of Christ our salvation, our hope, our King, and that they would build their lives on only that, that Jesus Christ died for sinners and rose from the grave. Thank you. I pray in in a way only you can, God, that you continue to fulfill your promise and build your kingdom and expand the gospel, Lord, through this region, through our world. God, may hearts even here today that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Salvation is in his name only. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must or can be saved. Only through Jesus. Holy Spirit, draw people. Draw us each to look to Christ today. Give us a confident hope in him. Lord, let us be a beacon to the world, a light on a hill as everybody is confused and and hurting and broken and wondering what answers can be known, Lord, we have answers because you have shown us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. Hide this word in our hearts. Thank you for coming the first time. Thank you, God, for all that was accomplished through Christ at that moment. Thank you for the hope that we have for the day that is coming, that someday in our future, but we do not look forward hopeless. We look forward with great confidence and we continue to stir each other up to be a church, to be lights for this world. Thank you. And we we give this to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, 
which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Saints, it's time for us to come together and remember our hope. The covenant made by God to save sinners like us. And so let's, uh, if you are in Christ today, if you are a faithful follower of Jesus, whether you just came to faith today in this, in this message, um, or if you've been following after him for a long time, uh, let's take a, take a moment here where we can reflect on what God has done to save sinners like us. Uh, again, to remember this hope that we have. Um, uh, but also, it's a time of uh, repentance, getting right with God. Um, and, then, and then we're going to share a meal together. Uh, just as the disciples did in the presence of Christ when he broke that bread and put that cup out there, we're going to do that together. Uh, and the way that we do that here is we've got the elements in the back of the room. When you've had a moment with your father, then go back and take the, uh, take the elements and join up in a group. You'll see, you'll see them forming back there. If you're here with your family, do it with your family. If you're here alone, don't do this alone. Let's do this together. And let's remember the hope that we have in Christ and what he fulfilled on the cross, but also the day of, of looking forward, the day of Advent. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, what grace you have given us, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Lord, the work of the cross, something not any one of us, any sinner could ever accomplish, Lord. Thank you for the, the knowing of the need of, of Christ, the, the depths of that, Lord, continue to show us. We needed the cross, Lord. We needed Jesus. We need him now. We need him tomorrow. Mm. Lord, uh, bless this time as we have in, in uh, sharing this meal together and proclaiming Christ's, Christ's death and also looking to his coming again. In Jesus' name.
Let's all stand together. We're gonna we're gonna worship the Lord with a few more songs. I wanted to share a, a fantastic quote. Uh, I actually I think it was yesterday I heard it. I don't recall, and who knows where I got it from, but um, it's a C.S. Lewis quote that I was reminded of um, when, when Joel talked about sort of that circle of, of uh, dissatisfaction, that circle of failing that uh, we can experience if, if our hope is in anything but Christ. So this made me think of this quote. It says, um, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. We, uh, we can get on that. Man, it's so easy to have our eyes on, on, uh, on the world and on what we're doing and we can see our worth and our satisfaction in, in what that looks like at the end of it. And I actually, it's just something that just the general idea has been on my mind. And I was just talking to Josh about it before service. And it, if our intent is to glorify God in what we do and is to look to him um, for direction, then, then we ultimately we won't be dissatisfied because Christ is always satisfying. The circumstance might not turn out to be what we think it might or should have been, but if our motivations were pure and it was for his glory, then we, we can have that hope that what we did was good and uh, ultimately was successful. Feel me? Let's hope in Christ. Let's do things because of what he's done and who we are in him. Amen.
It's a good first day of Advent, I believe. And I want you guys to make sure you leave here encouraged and, and uh, filled up and strengthened. So if you need prayer for anything, uh, even after that message, if you're still feeling like, you know, I don't have, I don't have hope, I, there's something, something off, we'd love to pray with you and p- show you some scripture and, and just be able to minister to you that way. So if you need prayer, the elders will be down front. Please take advantage of that time. Um, don't feel like you need to leave quickly. Stay in fellowship and encourage one another as the scriptures have told us to do. Amen, church? All right, let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for every visitor and guest that's here today. I pray that they will have uh, felt welcomed and, and loved and uh, cared for today. Uh, I just pray that, that you would continue to work in this church and, and expand your kingdom. God, use us as missionaries for you. Uh, help us, God, to go into the world now, this week, Lord, and with this message, proclaim the hope that we have and that we know others need. And so, God, continue to minister your gospel to, uh, to the lost. Thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your spirit that indwells us and for being a good father to us, Lord. So we go now and we trust you. We entrust ourselves to you. 